Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, Kant gives you several different formulations of this main principle that he uses called the categorical imperative. And the second formulation of the categorical imperative we have right here on the board, act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. And that's quite a mouthful. Um, so, you know, what exactly does that, that mean as a principle? If you wanted to really boil it down, and, and this is... Uh, you know, perhaps a little bit of oversimplification here. So I want to caution against, against uh, taking this to be the single way to do it. But if you really wanted to boil it down into a, a nice, easy thing to remember would be don't use people. But you'd have to remember, don't use yourself as well as, as using other people. And the, the, you also have to clarify what it means to use people in, in these sort of circumstances. Um, what it means to, to treat another person as a object of use. So, what we're going to do in this short video is look at the way Kant gets there and then what this actually means and how you would apply it. Um, but we're not going to look at, at specific examples, not the examples that Kant uses or uh, other examples, because I'm going to do that in some other core concept videos uh, dealing with this, this second formulation of the categorical imperative. So before we get to this formulation, Kant's going to go through a couple of, of important steps along the way. And it may look like just window dressing, but I think that if you actually do follow along with it, you'll get something out of it and you'll have a better understanding of exactly what he means by this, this principle. So he starts off by saying, the will is conceived as a power of determining oneself to action in accordance with the idea of certain laws. Um, now, this is a pretty typical Kant way of looking at things. The will is a capacity or power of determining oneself to action. The will is the faculty of choice. It's what we use to, to choose um, what we want to do, what we don't want to do, what we want to be, how we want to do things, how we want to be, all these sorts of things, what kind of relationships we want to have. Those are all a matter of will. And we can do this in accordance with laws, meaning we can do this in accordance, not with necessarily laws like, you know, um, the positive legal sense of, you know, speeding or not speeding or filling out your taxes properly or stuff like that, although that would fit in there. And not in the sense just of natural laws, like if I, you know, drop the chalk, the chalk is going to fall because gravity pulls it downward and, and, you know, gravity operates according to certain physical laws as well. What he means are we're, we're able to give ourselves rules. And, and a law is a rule, but it's not just any kind of rule. It's a rule that's supposed to apply universally or objectively to, to all beings of a certain sort. So if we're thinking in terms of humanity, we're thinking in terms of rational beings. So he says this kind of power to be able to choose to act to, to, to make oneself do things in accordance with laws, that is only found in rational beings. Now, how does this work? So he says, what serves the will as a subjective ground of its self-determination is an end. So what does he mean there? So a subjective ground of self-determination. When I choose something, I'm a subject, and what, it, what I'm using to ground my choice is the thing that I'm trying to achieve, attain, produce, the effect that I would like to, to occur, right, through my action. So I want to make my wife happy, 
um, I sing her a song uh, or give her a kiss or you know buy her a flower or something like that that's an action the goal of the action is the end that's what Khan is calling a subjective ground here um, now he says if it is given by reason alone, it must be equally valid for all rational beings. So if it's not just a matter of my subjective preferences or my personal history, but it's given by reason alone, it's kind of hard to find things that are given by reason alone. There's not an awful lot of them out there in existence. So, you know, buying my wife a flower is not going to be given by reason alone. That, you know, but say, while I'm in a marriage, I ought to, in fact, assure that my spouse be happy in that relationship with me. I think we could attain to that by, by reason. Kant doesn't spend a lot of time on those sort of things, but we could, we could work our way through those. Um, those would be equally valid for all rational beings. Now, he says, what on the other hand contains merely the ground of the possibility of an action whose effect is an end is called a means. So we have here the relationship between means and ends. You know, again, he's being very technical what is he saying? What contains merely the ground of the possibility of an action whose effect is an end. What, what gives you how you get from point A to point B, point A being where you are, point B being what you're trying to get to, that's a means. That's another way of thinking about it. So he says, um, we can now we look at this in two different ways. The subjective ground of a desire is an impulsion. The objective ground of a volition is a motive. And we have a distinction between subjective ends, which are based on impulsions. You know, for example, if I have, if I have an itch, right? Oh, you know, my, my arm, my elbow itches, and I start to scratch it. Uh, could be that relieving the, the discomfort of an itch is my end, and the means is actually taking my, my hand and, you know, rubbing it in a certain way. Now, if my elbow itches, that doesn't mean all human beings' elbows itch at this moment in time. That's a very subjective end, you know, relieving this particular thing. There's a lot of things along those lines where if we think about them, they're subjective ends for us, and they may be very important for us, but they are still merely subjective ends. They don't go for, for everybody, right? Um, now, he talks about objective ends. So some ends are objective, and those are valid for every rational being. So he says, practical principles are formal if they abstract from all subjective ends. They are material if they're based on subjective ends and, and uh, subject to certain impulsions. So th this further distinction between practical and material, um, you know, the things that concern us as individuals and not as rational beings in, in, in a you know, sort of matrix with all other rational beings, those are merely material, and those cannot guide our, our will in terms of moral action. Although, you know, they're good for us, but they're not good per se. So he says, um, ends that a rational being, so it's you and me, we're both rational beings, adopts arbitrarily as effects of his action, material ends. Those are merely subjective. Those are only relative. It's solely their relation to special characteristics and the subject's power of appetition which gives them their value. So, you know, again, very technical terminology. What does Kant mean? Well, you know, you have those desires or you have those inclinations. I have these inclinations and desires. And satisfying those is an end for me, but it's not an end for everybody. So, you know, for instance, I like this, this particular tie. And I've been told that it's not really that stylish anymore. Apparently at one time it was. But I, I like wearing this, so I'm going to wear it, right? It pleases my eye, and it may not please other people. Putting this tie on is satisfying some subjective end of me. That doesn't mean that all people need to wear ties, or even all people when they're shooting, you know, lecture videos need to wear ties or anything like that. It's not, a, it's not an objective thing in that sense. It's very subjective. It's relative. Um, now, Kant goes on from this. He says, suppose there were something whose existence has in itself an absolute value, not a merely relative value. Let's pause for a second, think about this. What does it mean for something to have a relative value? It will satisfy certain desires or inclinations that I have. 
So, um, reading Shakespeare, for example. I've got some Shakespeare on the shelf. Reading Shakespeare is a great thing. It's wonderful. I, I personally would, would love to see a world in which everybody could have the opportunity to read and to appreciate and even, you know, maybe even study Shakespeare with somebody who, who really knows what they're doing, which, by the way, is not me when it comes to Shakespeare. Um, but I have to grant that, that volumes of Shakespeare, at least from a conscient perspective, do not have some sort of absolute value in themselves. They're valuable as a means to certain ends. We can take them as ends. So, you know, the house starts on fire. I would very likely grab that, you know, the two-volume set of the collected works of William Shakespeare in, in uh, uh, opposition to some of the other books. Um, maybe there's, there's other stuff in, in, in here that I should grab first. <laughs> Volumes of books. Um, that has greater worth, right? They have greater value as ends. But it's merely limited. Um, now, is there anything that has an absolute value? According to Kant, there is. According to Kant, it's not just a matter of the way some philosophers think of everything just having a relative value for, for one person or for another person. He says there is something that actually has absolute value. So what is that? He says, this is something which as an end in itself could be a ground of determinate laws. That would be the ground of a possible categorical imperative. So what would that be? He says, man or humanity, and in general every rational being, exists as an end in itself. There's a lot more here, but let's pause over that and just repeat that for, for a second. Think about that. Every human being, even the most depraved, even the, the you know, most foolish, the most stupid, the most obstinate, every human being, by virtue of being a human being, exists as an end in itself. Something of absolute value. That is a really radical, startling thought. Kant is the only person who's thought that, too, by the way. Plenty of other people thought that before him, but, but Kant is really exploring this in, in a certain way. So he says, this would, um, this is, uh, this has value, human being, has value as an end in itself, not merely as a means for arbitrary use. Now, is that to say that human beings can't be used by other human beings? No. As a matter of fact, that's precisely what Kant is getting after. We are vulnerable to being used by other human beings. We can be, in fact, empirically, experientially, reduced to merely the value that we have for somebody else to attain what it is that they want. Um, you know, an extreme example would be um, cannibalism. The human being is reduced to just meat for another, another human being. Um, Kant is saying there's something wrong when that occurs. That that's ignoring something fundamental about us that makes us different from other animals, other beings in, in the, the universe. So he says, um, the human being must in all of his actions, whether they're directed to himself or other rational beings, must be viewed always at the same time as an end. That must is a moral must. It's not a logical must. It's not an empirical, this actually is the case. He's saying this is the way that we ought to actually see other human beings and ourselves. So he says, all the objects of inclination have only a conditioned value, for if there were not those inclinations and the needs grounded on them, their object would be valueless. Um, you know, they, they provide us only with certain hypothetical, he says, imperatives. Beings whose existence depends not on our will, but on nature, if they're non-rational beings, have only a relative value as means, and are consequently called, called things. So, you know, for example, um, this bread, it has value, it's good, it's nourishing, it's, you know, artisanal bread that I made, it has relative value. It doesn't have the value that a human being has. 
This book has relative value. This tie has relative value. This chalkboard has relative value. We could go on and on and on and on and on if we wanted to. Um, rational beings are called persons, he says, because their nature already marks them out as ends in themselves, as something which ought not to be used merely as a means, and consequently imposes, to that extent, a limit on all arbitrary treatment of them. Again, is he saying that it imposes this in an empirical sense, like, you know, I, I decide, hey, I'm going to use that person over there, and then, like, something pops up and, you know, says, no, no, you can't do that, you know, some sort of, you know, aura around them or something like that. No, this is not something empirical, this is something rational. If I'm actually thinking straight and I say, I'm going to use that person over there, I'm just going to use them, then something should, should be sort of triggered in my, my mind, maybe even at the level, although Kant wouldn't be too, too happy with this, just at the level of, you know, a feeling saying, eh, eh, that's not what you ought to be doing. That's, that's wrong. Uh, that would be a different kind of uh, imposition of a limit, right? So he says, if there is to be a supreme practical principle, a categorical imperative, it must be such that from the idea of something which is necessarily an end for everyone because it is an end in itself, it forms an objective principle of the will. It's something that motivates us, tells us not only as individuals but as rational beings among all other rational beings. That's what it means for it to be objective. Uh, it forms an objective principle of the will and consequently can serve as a practical law. What is the ground of this principle, he says? Rational nature exists as an end in itself. Rational nature exists as an end, not for other things, not as a, an end that also happens to be a means for something else, but as an end in itself, the, the, final, uh, the final thing. Right? I, can, I can make something like this, an end for me, I can say, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, you know, knock that person down so I can have this bit of bread. Uh, and why am I going to have that bit of bread? Well, that, that bread can then, as an end of one action, can become the means for another. So I can satisfy my hunger, or, you know, if I'm kind of, you know, weird. So I can satisfy my perverse desire for artisanal bread. Um, and then I can ask myself further, well, why in the hell do you need to do that? Well, you know, with the hunger thing, it's pretty obvious. So you can keep the body alive. Satisfying hunger then becomes a means, what? For another end. Uh, and we can go on and on and on with means becoming further, uh, ends becoming further means, until we have to get to a point where we say, well, this is, the, this is the ultimate reason. This is what's really valuable. For Kant, that's humanity. That's, I should put this, rational nature. That's what has value. That's what's at the end of the entire chain of ends. That's what's at, at the, the limit of that. So this categorical imperative, this formulation, is going to tell us how to do that. Um, let's look now at the actual categorical imperative. It says, Act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an ends. So, let's break this down now. There's four, you may not see it yet, but there's four main things that you've got to pay close attention to with this formulation. So, uh, one is... Act in such a way you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of another. This is about the way in which you treat humanity, your rational nature, your human nature, what it is for you to be able to make laws for yourself, to do right, to do wrong, to choose right, to choose wrong, uh, to set yourself goals, all those sorts of things. This is how you treat that 
in your own person or in another. So it, it's not just about how you treat other people. A lot of times people want to think that ethics is, is really just about how you treat other people and you don't have to worry about how you treat yourself so they're, you know, so long as you're not hurting other people, anything you want to do is okay. Kant would say there are some things that when you're doing them, you are doing something wrong to yourself, even if you don't hurt anybody else. You know, I think Kant would, for example, say taking illegal drugs, um, you know, the fact that they're illegal, you're actually breaking a law and that's doing something wrong in, in one sense. But if you're taking drugs that are, that are you know, doing something to, to uh, make you, well, to put you in a state where you're not yourself, where you're reducing your own rational capacities, uh, where over the long term you're degrading your, your own talents and abilities, um, maybe even your own organic structure if it does brain damage. If you're doing that sort of thing, Kant would say, even if you're not hurting anybody else, you are actually doing something wrong to yourself. And now what would the actual wrongdoing be? Well, again, act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, Never simply as a means, never just as a means, but always as an end. So you shouldn't just treat other people as a means. You also shouldn't treat yourself as a means, or at least the humanity within yourself as a mere means. You should always treat the other person as an end, as having value, as having what we call human dignity. Um, you should also treat yourself that way. That's what this categorical imperative is saying. Now I want to stress something that often gets overlooked in this. This is very, very important. Notice how this is framed. Never simply as a means. So, okay, so that's saying a means just by itself is off limit, but always at the same time as an end. Now, ask yourself this. Are those mutually exclusive? Is it the case that you're always either treating somebody purely as a means or purely as an end and never possibly as, as both? Let me give you an example where you are actually treating a person as both a means and as an ends. I use this when I teach my, my classroom uh, students, which makes sense. It doesn't make quite as much sense with the, the video. Um, when I'm teaching in the classroom, I'm getting paid to teach those students, right? So I'm, in, I'm imparting knowledge or, you know, cultivating learning or however you want to frame it. I am treating them to a certain degree as a means, a means towards my income, my sustenance, my survival, whatever you like. Uh, I might be treating them as means in other ways too. You know, if I'm the kind of professor who gets off, I'm being the sage on the stage, I'm, I'm treating them as a means for, for the end of my getting to feel like a big, you know, big professor or something like that. If I am treating my students kind of uh, meanly because I enjoy being a sadist and hurting people, I'm using them as a means as well, right? But let's just stick with income. Now, if I'm just making a buck off of them and I'm not actually giving them anything in return, I'm clearly treating them just as a means. What if for their money I give everybody an A and I also do kind of a song and dance and entertaining, you know, I shoot, show a lot of uh, non-class related videos and, you know, get into a lot of discussion, well, what do you think about all this? You know, just kind of make you feel good kind of stuff. Uh, I'm giving them something in return, right? They're sort of getting something for their money. I'm still just treating them as a means, because why am I giving them all this, this, this you know, entertaining crap, this, you know, uh, saccharine, you know, unnourishing uh, mental food, uh, so I can get something out of it, like peace of mind. They, they don't report me to the dean or, or anything like that. What am I supposed to be giving them? 
Student learning is supposed to be taking place, which means not just that they memorize a bunch of things and get them in their head, but that they actually undergo some degree of transformation, some growth as a person, at least in their intellectual faculties. If I'm doing that, then even though I am treating them as a means, I am also treating them as an end. Because I'm treating them as a rational nature which has dignity and worth in itself and if they've placed themselves in my hands and I'm an educator then the goal, the, 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 the whole point of the process there is for them to become educated so they are being treated as an end in that case. They're being treated as both an end and as a means. So it's possible to treat somebody as both at the same time. The key is not to just treat them as a means. Now, another thing that we got to clarify, another thing you got to think about that I, I don't want to leave you, I don't want to end this video without you actually um, having a clear concept of, is this. How is it that you can use yourself? Does that actually make sense? I mean, if what it is to be an end means the capacity to like give yourself ends to make choices, what we call autonomy, being able to decide for yourself, well then, you know, doesn't it seem like anything that you want to do would be A-OK -okay because, you know, you're treating yourself as an end, you're giving yourself what you want. Well, here's the thing, Kant would say, you got to look at the nature of the human person. What is it that you're composed of? Um, you have your rational nature, right? You have reason and you have a free will. And then you got all these appetites, desires, inclinations, and they want you to do certain things. And those things might not actually be in your interest. They may not be in your, in your long-term interest they may not actually be good for you on a higher level which has to do with your rationality. So for example, um, there are certain kinds of professions that even though they might be very lucrative and they might actually be fun to engage in, they would be morally degrading for you to, to pursue. Um, at least from a Kantian perspective, right? And if you, in fact, follow that sort of course, you would be treating humanity in your person as a means to the end of making money and having a good time. You would be treating the better part of yourself as a mere means to an end to satisfying the less good parts of yourself, the less worthwhile parts of yourself. So there are ways in which you can, in fact, treat yourself, treat a part of yourself as a means to the end for another part of yourself. And Kant would say, if that part of yourself that you're making the end is merely these subjective preferences and desires and not something like, you know, I'm going to cultivate myself so I can actually be a good person and I can do what I'm supposed to do and I can know what my duty is and do it. If you're doing that, you're treating yourself as a means to an end. Um, there's other ways in which you could, by the way in which you connect yourself up in relationships with other people, treat yourself as a mere means to an end as well. For instance, um, to be a flatterer, to be a toady, you know, is to try to get something out of somebody else. Um, to be a kiss, you know, a, a kiss butter, right? Uh, a yes man or yes woman or something like that. Kant would say that's, that's actually morally degrading. And it seems like you're also treating the other person as a mere means to an end too, right? So there's a problem with that. But you are lowering yourself to treat yourself as a means to that other person's ends. Because, you know, why do people like flatterers around? Because they make them feel good. And you're also treating yourself as a, a means to the end of whatever it is that you want to get out of flattering that person. Being invited to the great parties or, you know, making some, some money, having money tossed at you or getting prestige or something like that. Those are lesser values. Those are not the sort of thing that Kant thinks a rational being should place high up. And so you would be treating yourself, again, as a, a means to an end. So to bring this to a close, 
what have we got here? We've got a formulation of the categorical imperative that basically says don't use people, but now we've specified the way in which we're talking about this. When we talk about don't use people, we don't just mean don't use other people, don't use yourself. And by use, we mean you know, to treat just as a means, not treating as an end, not as something that actually has dignity, the capacity to choose, to set goals for, for oneself, to set ends for oneself.